Church today is the twelfth. Deanna, what is going on? I don't know. Why don't you tell him, Todd? Why don't you tell him, Todd? <laughs> I just miss that so much. I can't wait to get live again. I tell you, it's, oh, it's been so goodness. fun. But hey, if you are here for the first time, we have a challenge for you. It's very simple. We say, check us out three times. Yeah. Pray and listen and see if this is where God is asking you to grow spiritually. Yeah. And you know, you can go online on thepointchurch.net/connect. Um, on there is a communication card. We'd love for you to fill out, especially if you have any prayer requests. Let us know what you're going through. And even if you have any like really awesome praise as well, we do want to know that. Yes, we do. Hey, and every month we do a focus on the four. And like I said last week, today is the blood drive. Our goal is to get 30. There's still yep, time there's from still eight time. to one. So come on down. You can register online, get down here, be part yes. of that 30. And there's a special thing you can find out through the blood, giving of the blood, you can find out if you have the COVID-19 antibodies. Ooh. So that's something really cool to see if you've it's got very that. special. Yeah, so hey, come on down, help us get that goal of 30 yeah. because it's so important. Yeah, and today we're actually gonna be hearing from Steve K. That's right. So uh, Pastor Ray is on vacation. Hope you're having a great time, Pastor Ray, we miss you. And Steve's gonna bring the word today. It's gonna be really, really awesome. Excited for you guys to hear. That's sweet. Yeah. Hey, do you wanna pray? I'll pray. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for just the opportunity to meet again through the interwebs, Lord. Lord, we praise you for just being in control and being a sovereign, wonderful God. Um, Lord, speak to us today. We are we are inclined to hear from you. We are ready um, to hear from your word. And we, we just give you praise in advance for everything that you're going to do today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Back in the seventh grade, I was playing football for the Oak Harbor Rockets. It was the third game of the season, and I was playing both ways for the first time, starting on the offensive and defensive lines. For the first play of the game, our coach called a pass, which in the seventh grade is about as rare as, well, a touchdown. Still, the center snapped the ball, our quarterback rolled out to the right, and the guy I was supposed to be blocking cut right across me and drilled our quarterback just as he released the ball. 
a wobbly duck flew straight up into the air and miraculously it was caught by the other team. So I ran to tackle the guy with the ball and I reached out my right arm and I wrapped him up and as we fell to the ground, my two teammates, two of the biggest guys on our team, I mean, in the seventh grade, these guys were like 6'1", 230 pounds. And Jeremy, he landed on my body going this way, and Mick landed on my arm going this way, and my arm went snap! Oh, the pain, it was terrible. I laid there in agony, rolling on the ground. Now, adding insult to injury, no one noticed me writhing in pain. They even lined up for the next play. Not the coaches, not the refs, not any of the players. No one noticed me until finally one of the coaches on the sidelines saw me and pointed and they came out and they walked me off the field. First thing they did when I got off the field is they said, can you move your arm? I looked at it, tried telling it to move, but it wasn't going anywhere. So then they did probably the single worst thing they could have done. They said, let's get your jersey and shoulder pads off. So they pulled it up over my head, but to get it off, my arm had to go up too. Ah, oh, it still hurts when I think about it today. I gained some composure and I sat down on the bench, still, still in so much pain. And I looked over my shoulder to find my mother sitting in the stands. And when we made eye contact, what did she do? She pointed at me and she laughed. My own mother laughed at me. She thought I was having some sort of equipment issue. She didn't see, she didn't even see me rolling around on the field. That, that uh, year, I ended up having to have surgery on my arm, spent most of the year in a, in a sling, and then the rest of the year having so much atrophy that I really couldn't do anything. It was not a fun year. Have you ever had a moment like that where maybe not extreme pain, but you feel the emotional pain of, of being isolated, forgotten, belittled, insulted? That's what I felt like in that moment by my team, my coaches, and my mother. How do you respond in moments like that when you're slighted, insulted, offended? And you can imagine that seventh grade Steve didn't handle it the best. But you know, we're in the midst of a series where we're just letting Jesus speak to our hearts. Uncensored is what we're calling it because Jesus's words cannot be censored. And this that we're gonna be talking about today is the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus shows us how to respond in those moments where we feel insulted, offended, belittled. And not only that, but also in those moments, how to make an eternal impact on others. So let's dive in, and, and we're going to read a couple paragraphs, 10 verses right in a row, starting at Matthew 538. And this is where Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He continues, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, Jesus says, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is so much packed into those 10 verses from Jesus. Now, the thing is, though, you have to understand that everyone there listening at the Sermon on the Mount was waiting for a Messiah to rise up like King David and take back Israel by force if he had to. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is explaining what the kingdom of God really is and how we, all of us, must live in it. In these few verses, he turns the conventional wisdom of the day, the religious teaching from the synagogues on its head and corrects their misunderstandings in just these few verses. What he's saying is our first point today. We need to be influenced by the word, not by the world. Influenced by the word, not by the world. He starts by saying in 538, you have heard that it was said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. 
But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. This is directly from a well-known verse in Exodus 21. Many people in Jesus' time literally interpreted that verse to allow revenge or getting even or payback, retribution, right? That meant if you accidentally poked me in the eye, I get to turn around and poke you in the eye on purpose. That's what the Bible says. That's what they would say. Now, Exodus 21 clearly says that physical harm should be punished. That part of Exodus, though, was designed to create a form of civil justice. That is, like a court system. Judges were to decide the appropriate punishment for a crime using Exodus as guidance. But people in Jesus' time, they read Exodus as a commandment to dish out vigilante justice as they saw fit. I mean, that's insane. I mean, think about what that would look like today. Think about how road rage would happen. You know, you get cut off, I get to go around and cut off the next person. It just wouldn't work. Society falls down at that point, and that's what Jesus is saying. But even more than that, when he says, do not resist an evil person, he's saying that God will judge the intention of your heart, not just the action. So don't just apply the letter of the law without thinking about your heart. No, you have to get your heart right. This was so controversial that he was turning their understanding of the law on its head. He's saying, you think it's about what your hands do, but it's actually about what your heart feels. Now then, Jesus goes on to say, how do you do it? How do you live that out, right? When you focus on what your heart feels, the intention of your heart. Well, he, he goes on to say, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, this is a verse that is mis misunderstood today quite a bit. I want to be clear, this verse does not mean that we are called to be pacifists. It doesn't mean that self-defense is never appropriate. It doesn't mean that we have to take physical, emotional, mental abuse. That's not at all what it means. I mean, if you think about it, most people know that Peter was carrying a sword when they came to arrest Jesus. But we skip over the fact that Peter was carrying a sword. Why? To defend himself. It was pretty dangerous out on the roads when they traveled from town to town. Defending yourself is right if there's a threat to physical harm. But interestingly, the folks listening to Jesus understood exactly what Jesus meant. This wasn't even about physical harm. Back then, the ultimate insult to an individual was to backhand slap someone on the right cheek. It was not about pain, but it was the demeaning nature of the act. I like to think about like the old-timey duels. I challenge you to a duel, right? Anybody remember this? Oh, ouch! I mean, <laughs> that's taking tooth for a tooth to the extreme, right? You gotta love Robin Hood men in tights. But, but seriously though, Jesus says don't retaliate to an insult or get caught up in being offended. In point number two, he's saying, be engaged, not outraged. Be engaged, not outraged. Now, that's, that's easier said than done with social media today. Am I right? Give me an amen if you agree. I think this meme pretty much sums up what we're feeling today. 2000s. I'm offended. I mean, seriously. Anyone feel convicted? Make a comment. Convicted. How quickly... How quickly do we get involved in debates on social media and they devolve into a name-calling circus? You know, there's actually a book uh, by Ed Stetzer called Christians in the Age of Outrage. And one of his main points is that all too often, Christians don't act any different on social media than non-believers. You can't tell us apart. Now, one example that he brings up is the uproar over the Starbucks Christmas cup. Anybody remember this back in 2015, the Starbucks cup controversy? In 2015, Starbucks came out with a solid red cup over the holiday season. One single Facebook user posted a message that said, Starbucks removed Christmas from their cups because they hate Jesus. <laughs> I mean, what happened? A social media firestorm erupted where Christians badmouthed Starbucks, threatened to boycott, boycott Starbucks, and the thing is, a little known fact about all of this was that Starbucks had never done a Christmas cup before. 
They had always had a winter or holiday themed cup, but they'd never done a Christmas cup. That's the insanity that happens in the age of outrage. You know, there's actually even a principle called Godwin's Law that posits the longer an online conversation goes, the higher the probability of a comparison to Hitler approaches. <laughs> Think about that. Have you ever been involved in one of those conversations where all of a sudden you're being compared to Hitler or you're comparing somebody else to Hitler? That's insane. Oftentimes, people will say things online that they would never say in person. And yes, that goes for Christians too. So how do we avoid getting caught up in this age of outrage on social media? Well, I'll give you three simple tips that have helped me over time. The first comes from Juliet Funt, the CEO of Whitespace. She did Global Leadership Summit a few years ago. Um, if you've never attended, I really do recommend it. But she recommends that we ask ourselves, should this be a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional conversation? A two-dimensional conversation is short, simple, yes-no, fact-driven conversation that usually occurs via text, chat, or social media. And then you have a three-dimensional conversation. These are emotional, complex, deep, and nuanced. And they occur in a medium, medium that's face-to-face, -face, like video conferencing or a telephone call, or actually seeing someone face-to-face. -face. Don't you long for those days? Can't wait. And, and what she's saying is, should this conversation be a three-dimensional conversation or a two-dimensional conversation? Because what you never, ever, ever want to do is have a 3D conversation, that deep, emotional conversation on a two-dimensional medium. That is, via text, via social media. Because you can't read tone. You can't read intent. Save those conversations for when you're talking to somebody face to face and you'll soon find out that they won't devolve into something hate-filled. Now the second point which which I really appreciate is something I saw from Toby Mack a, a few weeks ago and he did a post on social media and he says I just saw a post I didn't agree with. I kept scrolling. Try it sometime. It didn't hurt at all. Hashtag speak life. What wise wise counsel from Toby Mack. Just ignore the noise. Don't get caught up in the outrage. Keep scrolling. Unfollow folks who make your blood boil. But, but be careful. Don't eliminate differing opinions from your life because those are important too. And then the third point, which is drastic. If you're still struggling with social media and this outrage culture, then detox. Step away from social media for a while. Delete it from your phone. Not permanently, but see how life goes on without it. Okay, all right, okay. I think we've addressed the don't be insulted or outraged part of it quite a bit. Now let's talk about the first part. What about being engaged? What does Jesus say about that? Well, in verse 40, he says, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now, now here Jesus is again pulling from the law laid out in Exodus. In Exodus 22, 26 through 27, it says, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, Return it by sunset, because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? The cloak or coat was an Israelite's most valuable possession because it kept them warm. It acted as a blanket, a sack, and a place to sit. So the law prohibited someone from taking your coat. But here, here Jesus again is turning the law on its head because he said it's not about the letter of the law. It's about your heart. And he says, if you're held liable or accountable for a wrong, go above and beyond. Shock others with your kindness. Give them your most important possession. <laughs> it's like being sued today and throwing in your car or your house as well. It's crazy, but that's what Jesus is saying, is kill them with kindness. Now, Jesus doesn't stop there. In verse 41, he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. I actually like the King James Version. Uh, and it, it says, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. I, I really just like that verse because I love the word twain. He split Robin's arrow in twain! Another Robin Hood Men in Tights reference. Let's bring that back, okay? If you're with me, if you're with me on the twain movement, put twain down in the, mess or in the message notes. Let's bring it back. Let's start using it. Just instead of saying two, say twain. I love it. 
Okay, you probably guessed it, but this is where we get go the extra mile from. Go the extra mile. Whenever I read this verse, I always think of my best friend, Andy. Um, we've been friends since the second grade, and when we were freshmen in high school, we lived about two miles apart. It was actually the closest we'd ever lived together. And it was, we, we both lived on this busy rural highway, Ohio, Ohio State Route 2. Actually, I have a picture of it. And you can see, it was a treacherous road filled with speeding semis and narrow berms. And we would walk along the side of that highway to reach each other's house. It was terrifying. Actually, I should say, I shouldn't say we. More often than not, Andy would come walking uh, to my house. But we made an agreement. And that was, you know what? We'll always meet halfway because the other shouldn't have to walk the whole way by themselves. And so Andy would inevitably start walking to my house and I'd start playing video games and I'd forget to meet him halfway. And he'd arrive sweaty because it was usually the middle of summer and safe, thankfully, but he was always willing to go the extra mile for me and he never complained about it either. That's why I love this verse so much. And that's what Jesus was saying. But again, this is one of those teachings from Jesus that had a very specific context back in the day. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. It wasn't at all weird to those listening. Back then, Roman soldiers were legally permitted to force Jews to carry their packs as they walked down a road or through a village. So what Jesus was actually saying to do is do what you're legally required to do, carry a pack a mile, and then shock them with your generosity by going that extra mile when you don't have to. I, I, I love thinking about that because, you know, we had an explosion of Christianity in the early church with the disciples and with the early Christians. And I think it was gestures like that. It was people living out what Jesus commanded them to do. And that, those actions, that heart is what grew the church. And we can return to that. That's what's awesome. Actually, St. Francis of Assisi puts it in great context. He says, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. That's what Jesus was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Get your heart right so that you are set apart from others. Kill them with kindness. And that brings us to Jesus's final point in these verses. In Matthew 5, 43, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what they were teaching in the synagogues at that time. Taken right out of Leviticus 19, 18, where it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people but love your neighbor as yourself. The religious teachers of that time perverted that scripture because they said, it says love your neighbor, love your people. It doesn't say anything about your enemy, so you should hate your enemy. And Jesus says, no, no. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> as much as the earlier verses we talked about today required us to go deep into the context and the history of those verses, this statement by Jesus is clear. It's undeniable what he's saying. There's no misunderstanding at all what he's telling us to do. It's just hard to put into practice. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect? How on earth? No, what Jesus is saying, and our third point is, be different from the world. Be different from the world. I like how Paul puts it in Ephesians 4, 21 through 24. He says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Your new nature, different from the world. Or in 1 Peter 3.16, where it says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Think about that. By your actions, by your heart, by your good deeds, 
they will be ashamed to have spoken against you. I also really appreciate what Martin Luther King Jr. says, and he puts it this way. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. He, what he's saying is when you get your heart right, your behavior will be a testimony of God's goodness. You will be a shining light of God's good work. What would our church be like, our community be like, our world be like if we always chose love over hate, engagement over outrage, giving over getting even? Man, I pray that for each and every one of you, that we can strive to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect so that we can bring others to Christ, so that our actions, our deeds, our heart can be that shining light. Now, some of you may be listening right now and thinking, I can't do this. This is way too hard. This isn't realistic. And you know what? You're absolutely right. None of us, not a single one of us can do this on our own. The only way that our hearts can be made full with forgiveness, with generosity, with love and compassion to those who don't deserve it is through Jesus Christ. Now we're going to pray here in a minute for those of you who feel like you've been going it alone and, and you're ready to put on your new nature, to throw off your former way of life and to strive to be perfect, even though we're all bound to fall a little short. But before we pray, I also want to say that, that if you're struggling with anger, with hurt that cuts deep, deep at your core, or another secret struggle, I want to encourage you today, today, seek help. All you have to do is email us here at The Point Church, help at thepointchurch.net. We have terrific counselors in Rick Canner and Miranda Harris who are here for you. So let's pray, okay? And, and listen, if, if you are sitting there and, and you, you, you said, I can't do it alone anymore, then just pray this with me. Just pray this with me. Father God, we love you and we thank you so much for everything you're doing in our lives. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. But God, some of us here, we've, we've been going it alone and we feel the pressure of the world on us. We feel the weight of our sinful nature. And God, we, we want to be made new. We want you to rip that off of us and give us a new nature, set us apart, make us different from the world. And if that's you, just say, God, I love you. I know you sent your son for me. And I believe that he died on the cross for us, that he was resurrected and that he rose to save us from sin, past, present, and future, Father. God, some of us are sitting here today and and we're thinking, we are far from perfect, far from it. And we're looking for a way to, to strive to be better, to get away from the outrage and to get engaged in people's lives so that we can help people find and follow Jesus. And if that's you, just, just say, God, I turn it over to you. I turn it over to you, God. I want, I want to be more like you. I want to live as you've designed me to live. I want to reach for people as you've designed me to reach for people. Father, just give me guidance and direction. Help me to find you. Help me to avoid the outrage. Help me to unplug and get away from the distraction of the world and to seek you. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, thank you, Steve. Thank you for pouring into us today. I am really thankful for our pastors and teachers here at The Point. Can we just thank God right now together? Put some amens in the comments and give some encouragement to Steve. Thank you so, so much. You know, it's been a blessing to be with you today. If you're new to The Point Church, don't forget to connect with us on our online connection card. Click over to thepointchurch.net slash connect to get that done. And if you'd like to give to the ministry of The Point Church, feel free to navigate to thepointchurch.net slash give. On that site, you'll be able to give by credit or debit or set up the text to give option by texting your favorite emoji to the number below. And that option is so, so fast. Once you take a few minutes to set it up, it might just become your favorite mode of giving. 
And we also um, are here on our Bass Road campus, Monday through Friday, nine to five. So if you'd like to drop off your gift in person, that'd be great too. Let us know you're here and we'll be here to receive your gift and uh, maybe even give you like a COVID elbow bump. And as always, that kiosk in the lobby works well. It's clean and safe. You can give it a quarantine elbow bump if you want to. It's a judgment-free kiosk. It will not judge you, I promise. Don't forget to like and subscribe also. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Stay connected with us. Subscribe on and uh, turn on all the little notifications so that we keep all the lines of communication open. And, you know, I'm really glad you came into service today. Heads up. You know, we will have um, our big homecoming coming up very, very soon. It's going to be so, so sweet. And I, I promise you, we're still going to be doing our thing right here on social media as well. And again, I'm really, really glad you were here. Happy Sunday to you. Virtual hugs and elbow bumps to everyone watching. I'll see you here next week. Bye.